So, uh, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about free will. But before I do that, I want to make a quick announcement. Um, I'm part of a, a group of people who are organizing a, a Models of Consciousness conference in um, Oxford in September. I do want to point out, uh, so these are some of the speakers that are listed. Um, we tried very hard to get to, to balance um, uh, minorities and, and um, women and stuff, and we had a very hard time. So I tried very, very, very hard. Um, you'll see all the names are white guys, but um, I tried. Uh, we got turned, people turned us down. But anyway, so if you're interested, uh, please sign up. Come. We've got about 70 people coming, and it, it should be really good. I also have to acknowledge my daughter, who's not here at the moment, for um, uh, fixing my fonts. But anyway. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of skip this slide for the most part, other than to point out this quote by uh, Robert Nozick, that um, in actions being non-determined is not sufficient for it to be free. Um, it might just be a random act, and that's something that um, is relatively Im um, important to this talk. So what is the essence of free will? Um, so the essence of free will is if I open my refrigerator and, well, first of all, this is assuming there's anything in my refrigerator. My son is sitting here and he usually eats most of it. Um, but um, if I want a, say, a carrot, okay, um, or perhaps a, a pepper, so let's say I have carrots and peppers in my refrigerator. If I make the choice that I want a carrot at that particular moment, I reach in and I grab a carrot and then I start eating it. Part of the assumption is that between the moment that I make the decision to eat the carrot and the moment and the, the point at which it gets eaten by me, it doesn't spontaneously turn into a pepper or a potato or something. We have this, this, this sense when we make choices that whatever we choose has a high degree of probability of occurring, right? Otherwise, there's no point in making the choice, right? If, 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 we're, if I could say, well, I want a carrot, but, but I know that if I stick my hand in there, it, I could get a rabbit, right? If that happened every time I went into my refrigerator, I would just give up. I wouldn't bother, you know, I'm not going to make a choice, right? I'm just going to reach my hand in and whatever I get, I get, right? So there's this sense that there's some level of... of of confidence that comes with making choices, that the, the choice we make is going to come true. So um, let's think of the world in terms of processes instead. Um, and I'll come back to choices in a minute. So if we think of the world as being made up of processes, you kind of have a continuum of processes. You can have deterministic processes, where like a fully deterministic process is one that just has one single outcome. Um, or maybe it has many outcomes, but only one outcome uh, uh, not even dominates, but is absolutely, if it's fully deterministic, it's the only outcome that occurs. So it really, there's really just one outcome. That's a deterministic process. Conversely, a completely random process is one where you have multiple outcomes, and they're all equally likely, meaning the probability distribution is flat, right? That's a completely fully random process. Now, all realistic processes that we encounter in everyday life are somewhere between the two, right? We rarely encounter fully random processes unless we're dealing with quantum random number generators or something. Um, of course, we very rarely deal with fully deterministic processes either. Um, I, I've, I've said, I, I gave the, the refrigerator example to Matt Liefer, who's here at one point, and, and, and he made some comment about, well, you know, it's never happened yet, right? And implying that maybe if I lived the age of the universe that at some point I would reach in expecting a carrot and it would be a pepper, but who knows? Um, so going back to the essence of free will then, um, there are some things that we can say about free will. First of all, free will is based on our ability to make certain choices freely. So the first thing we're going to say about free will is that that we're going to break free will down into this, this uh, the concept of us making choices. And the choices, we, we have to be able to label choices themselves as individually being free, okay? And, and free will is going to be some kind of amalgam towards this. So a choice can really only be said to be free um, if an agent can make some kind of judgment about all the possible uh, choices 
before they make the choice, in order to weigh them against one another. So, meaning they've, they've got to have some meaning to us, right? Otherwise, the choice is just random. The carrots and the, and the peppers. When I open my refrigerator, I have to stop and think, do I want carrots or peppers? And the free choice is I have to be able to say, okay, I feel like I'm in the mood for carrots. So I'm going to have, I'm going to choose a carrot. I have the freedom to choose a carrot. Because if you think about it this way, if you think if you were in, if you were in jail, right, and you, you said, I want a steak dinner, right? And you went to the warden and said, I want a steak dinner. And the warden's going to look at you and say, what are you, nuts? You're serving a life sentence. You, you don't, we don't serve steak dinners to people like you. So you can't freely make that choice, right? So there, there's something, there has to be meaning behind it. It has to have some, you have to be able to weigh these choices and make some decision. You have to have a reason that you make a choice over another choice. Um, and the agent has to have a high degree of confidence that the choice will be realized. This is which, uh, what I was just talking about with the refrigerator. You've got to, we, we have to have confidence that that is going to come true. Um, that if we make a choice, it will actually uh, occur. My take on this is that a certain... Um, an agent for whom a certain percentage of their choices is free could be said to have free will. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Now, of course, the reality is, is that the world, from a physics standpoint, and I'm, I'm, I'm a quantum physicist normally, um, the, the, there's a continuum of models, right? Um, we have quantum mechanics, which is uh, highly probabilistic and in many cases completely d random. And then we have, um, you know, all the way up to like general relativity, which is in theory completely deterministic. Um, so there are lots of different models out there. And one of the things that got me thinking about this was a recent essay contest where we were asked about um, how you could get something... Um, our, our sort of deterministic world out of something more um, random, right? Underlying randomness. And it turns out this is actually a pretty uh, st standard thing that happens in statistical mechanics, for instance. So if you have interacting systems of random processes, they can actually converge to a deterministic macrostate if the multiplicity is high enough. This happens all the time, in fact. This is the, called the thermodynamic limit. Um, so, for example, the, the, a, a classic example that doesn't quite get a, a spike like this in the multiplicity function is rolling a pair of die, right? So a single die um, remains a completely random, rolling a single fair die remains a completely random process. But when you put a pair of them together, you, you get some states that are more likely than others. And those are, um, that, that has to do with the combinatorics of the math. It's, there's nothing funky going on there. And it turns out you can actually get really big spikes in these things, um, for, for instance, in things like uh, two-state paramagnets and stuff like that, where if you have interacting two-state paramagnets, you can make it so that one macrostate is overwhelmingly more probable than another. And I think, and that's for what I'm about to talk about, that's what's important. Um, we want our choices, right? We want our choices to be, to have a macrostate that is going to be overwhelmingly probable compared to other ones. So if I choose, if to, for it to be free, if I want to choose carrots, I want to be sure that those, that I'm going to get carrots. So I want a, I want a, a multiplicity function that has a, a nice sharp peak and it's not sort of curved. So, in order to build a formal model of free will, um, how, how would we do that? So I'm going to make a couple assumptions. And again, one of the things, I've got 10 minutes, thank you, this is perfect. So one of the things I want to uh, point out here is that I'm not claiming that anything that I'm saying here is absolutely the be all end all. I'm basically doing what Scott said IIT was doing. Uh, nobody's done this, so I'm just going to stick my neck out there and do it. And I could be completely wrong, but that's why FQXI exists, right? I can take chances like this here. Um, and yes, you can laugh, that's all right, if it's totally crazy. But So one of the first things I'm going to do is assume that, that uh, in, in my model of systems, the most fundamental systems are irreducible to other systems. So they contain no interactions um, and cannot be partitioned. So we'll just start with that, and we're going to build up from random systems and move in the direction of more deterministic, de deterministic things. So the microstates of a fundamental system then are all completely equally likely in the long run. So this is how I build the choices. We build the choices up from small systems 
and uh, build towards uh, highly probable multi uh, macro states through um, making the, the multiplicity peaks very sharp. So a possible choice, what I refer to as a choice, is a, a process, and in this case it's a macro process, that takes a system from one macro state to another. And here is a key. The key difference is that a choice, different choices have are different processes. So me reaching in to grab the, the carrots is a completely different process than me reaching in to grab a, a pepper. Those are completely different processes. The, it's not that we have two different outcomes of the same process. We have two completely different processes. So a system's macrostates are formed from interacting microprocesses. So that makes a sense. Uh, that follows from the before. So the probability that a choice will lead to its macrostate is arbit arbitrarily high if the choice is free. This is the same assumption I was talking about before. We, we, we want to assume that these things are nearly deterministic because otherwise we wouldn't make them. Um, the number of n possible choices that, we, that a system has, in order for a, a specific set of choices or choice to be free, the choices that a person had before they met, made that, or a system made before, had before they made that, has to be small enough to be read into the system's memory in finite time, right? You can't, it's not a free choice if you're going to sit there until the end of the universe counting up all your, op your options, right? That's not a free choice. You have to be able to process it. So there has to be some limitations that come, come through from that. And the choices that are available to the system have to be determined by a combination of environmental forcing and internal dynamics. So the context we're in determines somewhat the choices that we're given. A free choice doesn't mean you can literally do absolutely anything. A free choice is somewhat determined by the context that you're in, right? So I can't just run outside and expect there's to be snow on the ground. I'm in Tuscany in the summer. It's not going to happen. So, and the choice is, here's the, here's the, uh, the other key, the choice doesn't, the choices, the other choices, don't change prior to the decision by the agent, right? So if I make a choice, I make a choice, I, after I've read through all the choices, in the process of reading through all the choices, some of the choices don't suddenly change. I, I, I want that to be true most of the time. So how do I capture this mathematically? Um, so let's consider a set of choices, and they, they all have distribution functions. Um, and mu is the mean, and uh, sigma is the variance of each of these. I can actually represent them as what's called a mixed distribution. Um, my father is a retired English teacher, and he would cringe at this, the word mixed distribution. I don't like that. That doesn't seem like proper grammar, but that's what it's called. It's a, called a mixed distribution. Um, and each of these things has weights. And so the weights are where the meaning come in. Come in. This is how we assign meaning to uh, each individual choice. And f of x is a, is a convex function, OK? All right, and the distance between any two of the, uh, the, the so it, it's basically a multimodal distribution, right? And the, the distance, distance between any two um, modes is given by this thing called the Mahalanobis distance. And here, sigma is actually the covariance matrix between any two, uh, for any two choices. The, the clear sense here is that, for instance, uh, the Mahalanobis distance between, say, the, a pepper and a carrot is larger than, say, the Mahalanobis distance between one carrot and another carrot, right? So you might have a short carrot and a long carrot. Well, that's going to have a smaller Mahalanobis distance than a distance between a carrot and, thank you, five minutes, um, than one carrot and a pepper, for example, all right? So I'm using the Mahalanobis distance as a, a measure of how distinct the choices are. And the assumption is, is that the larger that value, the more distinct those choices are. So for a given choice, or a set of choices, and then you make the choice, um, for a given number of possible choices n, the freedom of choice i is given by some function that is a, uh, it, it's a function of the minimum Mahalanobis distance between this choice and any other choice in the ensemble. And what I'm calling, so I call it tau of n, which is the time it takes to read all n choices into memory and, and process them, okay? 
And, and it should be inversely proportional to that. And also inversely proportional to um, the variance, because the variance is what tells you the sharpness of the peak, right? So, or it's one measure for the sharpness of the peak that you can do. Um, there are others, but um, right now I'm working with that one. So this, this is what defines a free choice, the zeta function. And that's for a single free choice. So there are lots of choices that could be free, but, and they could be made by systems that are not, don't have free will. Um, but that, the, the point is, is what is free will then? So a measure of free will would be if you had a given number of processes that result in choices, a system's free will is going to be given by some kind of partition function that is a function of all of the zetas for the different choices. Meaning the, free, the level of free will depends in some way on the freedom of the choices under consideration. And the ex expectation of this is that there are going to be different levels of free will for different systems. So, for instance, there are increasing, I would expect that an increasing level of complexity is going to lead to an increasing level of free will from uh, a bumblebee or a, a honeybee uh, to maybe a computer to uh, my wife. Um, and it's not, you know, I assume that the level of free will goes up that way. Maybe it doesn't, but I'm, that, that would be my assumption. So this leaves a bunch of questions, of course. So first is, is this, can this model produce real measurable results? And um, um, I'm, I'm hoping eventually that it does. Um, does it necessarily presuppose a dualist view of consciousness? It certainly is panpsychist. Um, whether it's dualist or not, I haven't decided. Um, it certainly seems like it ought to be. But um, I'm not entirely sure about that. I had some interesting discussions with Paul Davies on the hike today about that. So I'm, I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, is it compatible with existing theory, formal models of consciousness? So that's one interesting thing I'm, I'm looking at is I, I would like it to be, I would like it to be at least to compatible with, with uh, IIT um, I, because I, for the same reason that I, 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 I like IIT, but, um, and I think it's, two minutes, thank you. I, th I think that's a, it's a good thing to be um, at least reasonably, like it shouldn't contradict it, let's say that. Um, as a quantum guy, I'm always motivated by quantum things, and so I'm, I'm curious to, to see if this model can make predictions that are consistent with uh, various, um, uh, you know, models like the Bell tests, can, will it, um, because the, the free will assumption is an assumption that is made when you do a, a Bell test. Um, and, uh, you know, can I work this into some kind of Bell model? And I, uh, you know, that, that's trickier than you would think. But anyway, these are some questions that, of course, it raises. It raises lots of other questions as well. But um, I just want to uh, take a moment then to acknowledge a couple of people for sort of pushing me along on this project, uh, Robert Prentner um, and, and some folks at a workshop uh, I helped run in, in Dorfstein uh, a few months back. Um, I thank my son for making a key point on meaning. And then if you're interested in some of the early ideas, these are a couple of papers here um, that I published on it. Um, I should have a paper on the whole thing coming up soon. Um, grazie. <laughs>